Indian viewers, this is Aparna Banerjee and I am with UK slow MP Tanmanjit Singh KC who is finally in Jalandhar after uh, there was a hold up at the Amritsar airport uh, yesterday regarding his OCI car. So we will talk to him about this controversy is uh, all about the OCI car seems to get into trouble again and again all the time. We will talk to him about what actually happened and he has been very vocal about uh, the problem that he faced. What happened actually there though, with your uh, car? But I, mean, look, I was born in, in Slough, in that area in the, of the UK, but despite being born there, I lived and uh, studied in uh, India for about four years. I often come back here, especially to Punjab, where we have family links, and I think that you know, this is part of my ancestral heritage, that's something that I should be connecting with, so much so that I've actually sent both of my kids to study here. So they have had the benefit of connecting with that aspect of their culture as well. So I actually left the UK uh, from London on an Air India direct flight to Amritsar. I landed in Amritsar and uh, you know, they checked the passport and they said visa size so presented my OCI card. They checked the OCI card. When they scanned it, they said, that it seems to be that there's a problem with the OCI card. Right. I said, okay, they said, if you would be kind enough to just to sit down here for about 10 minutes. So I duly went and sat at the side for 10 minutes. 10 minutes passed, 15 minutes passed. Then I said, well, look, what's happening? All of the uh, other travelers on the flight are all leaving. I'm still here. Yeah. Please advise me what the issue is. So they then said that uh, your OCI, there seems to be a problem and that it seems to have been suspended and uh, we will now need to look through this because if it's not, if the issue is not resolved, then you will have to go back. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, we need to get clearance from Delhi. As I'm interrupting here, but did you did you get any information from the MER from the Indian government that, you know, that was held up or it was, no? No, no, no. It, not it came to you as an information when you landed there. That's it, yes. Yeah, so yeah, not right. any such information. In fact, I have spoken and met with the Indian High Commissioner in London on various occasions, attended functions together. We've had very, very good uh, conversations and discussions on that. Uh, and there was no information from anybody that that was the case. Even when I left the airport in London, when they duly checked my passport, my ticket, my OCI, which is obviously a lifelong visa for non-resident Indians like myself, that, that, that is never, uh, that was never an issue. So when I came, it's the first time that ever been the case. Uh, anyway, when I learned of this, and I rang my father, Jaspal Singh Desi, uh, who happened to be in, in India at the time, I also rang my uncle, my dad's younger brother, Pandit Singh Raipur. He is actually an SGPC member here in Ardenpur, uh, in Jalandhar district. Uh, so I said to them, I know you are waiting outside, but there seems to be a problem here. They are saying that uh, there is an issue with my OCI card. They then were very worried, my family, they then rang around different places in Punjab and Delhi, look what's going on. Then other people must have rang and before and if the news had already spread far and wide. Even those who were in Amritsar Airport, a couple of uh, them actually recognized me. They said, look, sorry, this is something that you, uh, uh, we have to do this, but we just knew the process uh, that because of what's showing up on the screen, really sorry, etc. Uh, and many of the travelers, Naturally, if there is a flight from London coming to Amritsar, it's full of Punjabis. Yeah. And most of them ended up knowing me. So they were all asking what's going on. Then the next flight landed. They waited. From, they waited to see what's happening. They were able to see what's going on because Africa. they could see that I was being asked mm -hmm. to sit on the side. Then the next flight from Birmingham came along. They naturally being uh, mostly Punjabi. A lot of them knew me as well. They said, look, what's going on? Why? I said, uh, how, how much two and a half hours. They asked me that, uh, look, how long uh, have you uh, been a member of parliament? I said, well, for over six years. Uh, in fact, I've been serving as the MP for Slough, I'm also a shadow transport minister. I come here on a regular basis. They said, when was the last time that you came to India? When was the last time, sir? So when, yeah, when was the last time? So I came in April of last year. Okay. And At that time, also, there was trouble with the OCI card. Some people had, a, you know, I, th I believe they've, they'd given a complaint. No, not, not, not against me. So I came here as okay. normal. In fact, as I then clarified afterwards, because when I left the airport, yeah. I saw that there was a lot of incorrect reporting going on of the news. Okay. Some people had said that, uh, oh, uh, he didn't have all of the required paperwork. Right. 
Some of them said that uh, you know he'd come on a flight from Birmingham. So there's a lot of inconsistencies in the story. And what and have you got to know so far? How was it suspended? What was the trouble with the OCI card? You have a valid yeah, OCI card. So it. what was the trouble? Who who raised an objection? Or where did it come from? I'm this not time? sure. So I okay, uh, sure, uh, would hazard a guess that last time when I came, I felt the love. I felt a lot of the. the the warmth of the people here, whether it was from the Indian farmers unions, whether it was from civil society, a lot of people who were happy that I had spoken up about their human rights when they were being forced with water cannon and lockies and tear gas during the farmers protest. So they naturally were very, very happy. Uh, however, there were certain individuals who were calling for my visa to be banned and said that the uh, during the farmers' protests, and said things that are anti-national, anti-India. They so Pakistan, another charge being made. That's obviously a lot of nonsense because they know that, that neither of us had anything against any political party, and neither of us had anything against India or anything of that nature. I think it's very easy for individuals, especially on social media, to be making slurs, accusations against individuals. And for the Sikh community, we feel it most intensely. We saw that during the farmers' protest that these individuals didn't even spare Indian farmers who make sure that they are feeding the nation. They call them anti-national, they call them separatists. If a Sikh person says something, all of a sudden they are being termed as Khalistani. If a Muslim person says something, all of a sudden they become Pakistani. If, they, if a Christian person says something, all of a sudden they become friendly, they become foreigners, outsiders. That's no way to be bringing communities together and those individuals need to be taken to task rather than individuals like myself who are constantly wishing and praying and working for the betterment of all, for the betterment of people within India, your neighbouring nations. We are constantly wishing and working towards peace and cooperation. In, in terms of coming to Amritsar and, and uh, if we talk about the Punjabis, I think very few people amongst the NRIs from outside of the Punjab could have been such vocal supporters of Amritsar Airport and the need for direct flights. For over six years since I've been serving as the MP, I've been demanding and working towards that, holding various meetings with British Airlines, with Indian Airlines. When I came, when I was first elected, even prior to becoming elected as the MP, because I've served for a decade as a councillor, as a mayor, I then said, even then, I said, look, there's a need for direct flights. We are very, very annoyed that for Amritsar, which is one of the first six international airports within India, why does that not have daily connectivity to other parts of the world, especially where there are large diaspora communities, for example, London, Birmingham, Toronto, New York, Vancouver, etc. All of these places need to be having more connectivity because that's how we can increase trade, we can increase tourism. And even when I became MP, first thing that I did was upon paying obeisance uh, at uh, the Barsan in Amritsar. I also then had meetings here in the Punjab with the Chief Minister, with opposition parties. I also then went on to Delhi as well, whereby <coughs> I met up with the then Foreign Minister, Srimadhi Sushma Samaraji, with the then Finance Minister, Arun Jaitliji, because I knew that he, they also had connections with the Punjab. So I was asking them that how can we push forward these issues with regards to the NRIs, whether there's issues with the land disputes, whether there's these direct fights and many other issues, we need help and assistance from yourself. I, being an elected representative, mm -hmm. uh, am requesting your good selves on behalf of the NRIs that if you can please take on board these issues. So, so I've done is, that in the this past. This is what my next question is you, uh, in cities and in many countries. Recently, there seems to be a problem with, with uh, large, large sections of the diaspora. This bogey or this issue of Khalistan is being repeatedly being raised. So, so what? Do, what do? You, why? Why is this problem, you know, creeping up uh, again? In, in between, it had just uh, you know sort of subsided. It, it was a passive issue. No one was paying attention to it. But uh, during the farm uh, andolan, kisan andolan, or the kisan protests, yeah. and after in the aftermath of it, with the Canadian government also, it has been taken up, and with you also, you know, with your OCI card also, this issue is. What do you think seems to be the problem? Well, look, anybody can have any views that they like. As long as they're expressing those peacefully, and that's all fine in a sophisticated democracy, that's all part of the course. We have that here in India, we have that elsewhere, where people are able to make those uh, requests or whatever they want to say. 
However, in terms of whether it's separatists or whether it's nationalists and so on, that's always been the case for decades uh, and that no doubt people from different viewpoints will continue uh, with, uh, their, you know, with their assertions. However, what I think should not be happening is that everybody is painted with one brush, whether it's being nationalists or separatists or pro-India, anti-India, pro Khalistani, pro whatever, that's, that's not how things work. The Sikh community is very diverse. It has various viewpoints. You mm -hmm. see that here mm -hmm. from within India, mm -hmm. within Indian polity. Mm -hmm. If we look at here, we are sitting today in Jalandhar, if we look at Punjabi politics, there are different political parties, whether it's the present government, the opposition parties. Amongst, amongst those opposition parties, there are nationalists, there are separatists, and so on. So that's just part of the democratic process whereby different individuals can hold different viewpoints However, it is not correct when certain uh, individuals, unscrupulous individuals, and try to paint everybody with that same brush, or try to portray one particular issue as being the preeminent issue. What, what do you think seems to be the solution to this? There's such issues. I think certain people will be increasing their uh, vocality on certain particular aspects, but most people, whether it's in the UK, are concerned about schools, roads, hospitals, education, that's what consumes their attention most of the time. Their attention is not consumed by what's going on in India. And you feel or, the same about the Sikh community. Yeah. And yeah. likewise, with our people in yeah. India, they are concerned about certain issues here, rather than what may be happening in other parts of the world. Now, that's just a part of the general day-to-day -day discourse. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I would say is that uh, you know, uh, it, it is incumbent upon those in the administration, those in the government, to be making sure that they are not misled by individuals who are making allegations and slurs against anybody and everybody. They need to be making sure that they have gone through and checked the appropriateness of the individual, their and track so record, the yeah, yeah. and whether they've been acting as responsible citizens, whether they have been making sure what sort of service have they conducted, how uh, uh, have uh, if they are members of parliament, if they are doctors, nurses, what have they been doing, rather than listening to complaints of certain individuals, who, by the way, uh, make those sort of assertions on a day in day out basis, even on social media, the amount of trolling from fake accounts. I mean, I took that took those individuals to task because when they make either racist or derogatory remarks on social media, I called out the two rupee tweet to the troll factory. Right. I said, this is what we are faced with. And what they don't realize is, is when they are posting on individuals like myself, when they're posting on those profiles, people in the UK, including British journalists and global journalists and the wider public are getting to see what's going on. So they get to see that debate yeah. and they who then can also make up their own mind. In fact, as a result of all this trolling of certain individuals and all these fake accounts and multiple attacks, investigative journalists uncovered that there seems to be indeed Twitter troll factories operating. Yes, yes. And uh, that, I think, those individuals who are purporting to be pro-national are actually the ones that are anti-national because they are damaging the reputation of the very country that they profess to be claiming that they are working uh, for its progress. And finally, it happened was because you have been speaking in favor of farmers and, uh, on human rights issues concerning the six. Well, look, uh, uh, for now, I think if we look at the fact that last year I came here, no problems, and while there was a lot of love in the air, and uh, I felt that there were certain individuals who were calling for my visa to be banned. It doesn't take a genius to work out that the following occasion when I come here, yeah. that uh, there seems to be a problem with the visa. These individuals have made certain complaints to get that OCI suspended, uh, but um, thankfully within two and a half hours the issue was resolved and they said look that's Has the, the complaint, matter. the demand for suspension also been resolved? Yes, that the whole of the suspension, everything else with the OCI, that was all resolved okay. and that's, uh, but it shouldn't have come to that. I think that yeah. during that whole process, this would have put off a lot of people from travelling that they could think if it can happen to a member of parliament, it could have happened to any of us and more to the point, that it's not just people in India that have been aware of it, people globally become aware 
I uh, was contacted by members of parliament in the UK. We heard that this has happened. Are you okay? So I said, no, don't, don't worry, let everybody know that I'm fine. There's no such problem. I'm here with family members. It was an issue for about two and a half hours. That was resolved. Uh, that's all part of when you are raising voices uh, on human rights issues. And I know that when I've raised issues, for example, with regards to Pakistan, when it's, whether it's uh, in terms of issues there with regards to minorities, when certain incidents have occurred against the minority Hindu community or the minority Sikh community or the Christian community there or the MBA Muslim community, when we've issued reports on behalf of parliamentary colleagues, then we, some people say, well done. Well done, Parliamentary Tessi, that's great. You're doing great work on human rights. There are others who then go and say, oh, this person is anti-Pakistani, he is anti-national. He uh, is all part of a conspiracy because because of his Indian heritage, he must be doing the bidding of the Indian government and that's why he's saying all these things against Pakistan. That's a whole lot of nonsense, but anyway, that's their reality as far as they see it. When I've raised issues with regards to Sri Lanka, now that's the neighboring country again to India. When I've raised issues there, when there were uh, uh, certain uh, attacks on human rights of, say, for example, the Hindu minority community there, or whether it was indeed during the COVID uh, pandemic, when there were problems faced by the local Christian and Muslim community who were not being given burial rights, it was this Bangladesh Nazis who stood up there and said that that's wrong. What, it, what are UK ministers doing to interact with their counterparts in Sri Lanka that we stop this abuse of human rights? If we look to the east of India, uh, then we look to Myanmar. There, the Rohingya Muslim community were so badly mistreated. Lots of people were killed. You had hundreds of thousands had to flee their own country. I didn't look that they were Muslims. Mm -hmm. I looked at the fact that these are human beings being mistreated as a minority. So it's my job to be raising issues. Now, there were certain people, whether it was in Myanmar or Sri Lanka or Pakistan, they said, oh, this person is anti-national. This person, so and so. No, global issues, human rights are global issues. They are universal. And it is incumbent on all of us, whether whatever nation we may be from, to be standing up for the human rights of others because when it comes to our turn, nobody will be standing up. And being a Sikh, it's my job. We are taught by our Sikh gurus, whether it was the fifth guru that was persecuted to death, whether it was the ninth guru who gave his life so that others may be able to express their religion as they feel. We as Sikhs, we face persecution throughout the centuries, but we are also taught that we must be acting in with Sarvadapala for the betterment of all, goodwill of all, and that's how we actually achieve goodwill. It's because we don't just stand up for our rights, we stand up for the rights of others. So I think that is important. She thinks you talk about the man well, Look, I think um, some of those incidents, many of us were very, very shocked and saddened to see those. Uh, and you know, they didn't just make the Indian media news, they made global media news. Uh, I think what happened, for example, in Manipur, the mistreatment of women in particular, that was, you know, it was shameful. It shamed not just the people within Manipur, not just people within India, but all of us as humans. So that's why I think we must all make sure that those human rights abuses are called out and the government then takes action. I know that it is. Uh, you know, those such issues are uh, in now with the highly respected Supreme Court that they are now dealing with that and no doubt they will take uh, the appropriate action. But uh, yeah, I, I sincerely hope that they will be resolved very soon. Okay. Uh, finally, a bit about the UK. It, it's also a personal uh, interest with me. Yeah. Floods are happening in Punjab. We'll also take your version on that. But recently, you know, they, um, the activists put a, a black cloth on the house of uh, the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunan, Greenpeace activists. Oh, right. Yeah, yes. you must be aware about yeah. them. So, this, you know, this climate change is sort of, this is a problem in India, this is a problem in the UK. The, uh, very robust protests, very intense protests are happening there as well. What do you think about this issue? Yeah. Climate change, the climate crisis, is the number one global crisis impacting humanity. And if we don't wake up to that, we will be sorry. Climate change deniers have held back progress on cleaning up our economy, cleaning up the world in which we live. And we must all take collective action. That's something that we in the UK have realised. 
I think people, many people in India and elsewhere, they've realized that as well. And that's, we've got to take collective action. Because as scientists have been pointing out for decades, that the freak weather events, whether it's flooding, whether it's extreme heat, whether it's wildfires, their intensity will increase year on year. Temperatures will be increasing year on year. Sea levels will therefore be rising. So that's why we need to take a remedial action. Do you think enough action is happening to counter fossil fuels? Activists complain that that, that, that is not the that, case. That was the issue. Yeah. In the UK, yeah, yeah. where the government, the Prime Minister said that we want to take action. Then, they go and issue more than 100 licenses to oil and gas companies. Yeah. And that is what incensed many people within the UK, including me, and we were vocal about that. that that's no way to be talking about it. We need to be on the super highway towards renewables. So that is more onshore wind, offshore wind, in terms of solar, and in terms of insulating homes properly, in terms of making sure that we have electricity not generated from hydrocarbons, not from burning fossil fuels. So that's something which the Labour Party and the Sir Keir Starmer's leadership, we've talked about. And Sir Keir Starmer actually came out and said that under a Labour government, and touch wood, there will be a Labour government very soon next year uh, in the elections, that we will not be giving any more oil and gas new licenses. Okay, those contracts at, at the moment, that one state expired, that's the end of it. We will be pushing in a major way with a £28 billion pound a year climate investment fund that we make sure that that climate uh, pledge is towards renewables. That's the drive that we should be on. There is talk and, let's see what And that's why certain protesters, I know that they, over this, um, in certain movements, they are more vocal, that they take more direct action. And many of us have said that, look, we want to be taking everybody along with us. We need to be making sure that we tell the government to get on the right path, but it should not be to the detriment of the average day-to-day -day person as, as, as he or she is lawfully going about their business. But it is an utter failure of the Conservative government and the Prime Minister who have gone back on their uh, on their word, who rather than accelerating towards the transitioning of the economy, are sending completely the wrong signal, not just to people in the UK, but across the globe. How can that Prime Minister then go and tell anybody else to not be going towards hydrocarbons yeah. if he's issued more than 100 licenses to those uh, companies. And that's why a lot of accusations were there that, look, the funding of certain individuals within the Conservative Party and sometimes uh, even the previous Prime Minister, for example, uh, the biggest donor towards her donation was the wife of a former BP executive. And these, these are issues, by the way, that I raised on the floor of the House. Yes. That, that, that needs to be called out and we must make sure that we hold our leaders to account however short they, their tenure may be and i hope that the current prime minister is a lot shorter than uh, anyone like to think that we need to ensure that they are doing the right thing by the planet by our nation for the next generation but in particular children look i'll say they are a charity that emanate from the uk uh, in fact they were previously based in Slough. Their founder is, is also from that area. I know that they do a lot of great humanitarian work across uh, the globe, and I think they need to be commended for that. And I do hope that organizations, like I can't say these individuals, these organizations, must be able to undertake their humanitarian work, and that's the request that I would make of authorities here. Right. And finally, what do you think about the flood scenario in Punjab? Do you, since you've been so vocal on climate change and the action on it, do you see a link? And do you think, you know, this, since you are a person who understands the scenario here and there, do you think there needs to be more people who talk about it globally in a way, you know, that joins the two countries and they come together and talk about it rather than no, not just on the formal platform, but informally also there needs to be advocacy in climate change. Floods is sort of a, sort of a, a manifestation of that problem. Yeah, definitely. Look. This is something that I have raised previously. I was very, very shocked and sadly to see the floods in the Punjab. Whether it was in Jharkhand, Punjab, in, in India, uh, we saw the devastation wrought upon communities. We saw that also in Lenda, Punjab, in Pakistan, Punjab, Last where year. there were several deaths. 
And I think these peak weather events, in terms of generally, we have been warned by scientists for a long, long time that we need to take remedial action to ensure that the worst impact of climate change can be the, 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 can be curtailed. So if we don't take action, if we don't change our behaviours as individuals, as governments, as humanity, we will then be sorry because it, the, it, the, the impact, the, the changes that we need to bring about now might just cost us billions of dollars. If we, don't, if we don't take action, the, uh, to deal with the consequences will end up taking us hundreds of billions of dollars, not more, because of the devastation. Whether it's authority in Punjab, whether it's authorities in Rwanda, in India, and across the globe, it's a similar request that we make of our own government as well. Please take the climate crisis seriously. Please take remedial actions, and we must accelerate towards renewables. The civic society itself must put pressure on their elected representatives to say, look, this is an issue that is of importance to us. That in the UK, for example, now, in terms of electric vehicles, that they now comprise more than 20%. There's right. been a huge acceleration just in the last three or four years. It is incredible. We look at how more solar panels going up, more onshore and offshore wind. All of these things are very, very important and we must demand better from our locality, but also from our electric representatives.